Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. We're going to actually look at 44, 45, 46. Celebrating treasures. What meaneth this? Jesus is speaking in uh, parables. Parables are stories, illustrations, and within those stories or illustrations are truths. And these truths help us to live uh, in abundance. They help us to live with purpose. They help us to enjoy life. If you're here today and you just have a sense that, you know what, I don't know how it would happen. I don't know if it could happen. I don't know if it's worthy of happening, but I need to connect with God in some kind of way. Some kind of way where I know that I sat here today and what I experienced connected me with him in a way I would not have been connected with him had I not been here. There's something encouraging here for you. There's something uplifting for you. There's something restorative here for you today. There's something revelatory here for you today. There's something restful and peaceful and loving and compassionate here for you today. I don't know what your need is, but you've come to the right place. He's a God that meets every need according to our riches and his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. What is your need? Ask him to meet it. He will. He's very relevant and very present. It goes like this, again, comma, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And then he follows that with, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Okay, we got a theme going on here. You have the word again. Again, again, the kingdom of heaven. So in other words, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna say something else to reiterate the point that I've been making about the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to use redundancy as a teacher, which is a law of learning actually. Redundancy is a law of learning. I'm going to come at this from a different angle. I'm gonna to speak to you from a different perspective. I'm gonna give you something that you can relate to perhaps better than the previous parable. But I'll tell you at the end of the day, what I want you to know is what the kingdom of heaven is all about. I want you personally to know what the kingdom of heaven is all about. How you can live in light of and in, in, in anticipation of the coming kingdom and the kingdom that is within you. Jesus is very serious about this and he wants these people to understand it. Again, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. The kingdom of heaven remains a relevant topic in any culture at any time in any millennia. Because we are so enamored with, so influenced by, so ingratiated with, or so repulsed by the current culture. It's always something going on. There's always something going on in the world that everyone's in favor of or not so much in favor of. There's always a tension between what we know we want on this earth and what is happening. Not only here, but around the world. There's oppressive governments, there's tyrannical governments, there's democratic governments, there's republics, there's free, there's always something. The world is always having some issue with somebody, some tension, some polarity, and oftentimes with the church. But Jesus said, I want you to be aware of the kingdom of heaven. And he wanted people under Roman oppression at that time to know that there was a different kingdom and that life would not be defined by the actual kingdom that actually oppressed them. So, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven and he's likening it to a treasure. Is it just me, or I've seen National Treasure about, I don't know, four, 416 times. <laughs> like, it's only one of the few clean movies on TV sometimes, so I just watch it again. It's not like Nicolas Cage is my favorite actor, okay? I'm just saying, I've seen that movie a billion times. And then I think 208 of those, half as many times I've seen the second one. But what I like about it is that they're treasure hunters. Treasure hunters, to me, are, are cool. I like the ones on the sophisticated uh, cable stations, Discovery and History Channel, where they raise a bunch of money, then they take a boat out, and they've got this long thing that goes down into water. They find the Titanic, or they find some warship, or they find some, you know what I'm saying. It's kind of cool. I like treasure hunters. Um, Jesus liked treasure hunters, and that's why he's telling a story about one. Are you a treasure hunter? Uh, this is not a bad question. Are you a treasure hunter? You see, kingdom of God and being a follower of Jesus Christ is, let me tell you what it's not. It's not you and me in our walk with Christ 
that has anything to do with passivity. We're not sitting around waiting to receive something, as though we're sort of entitled to do so, and then once we receive it, we'll throw God a bone or thank him for it and move on. No, no, we're called to seek, we're treasure seekers. We are called to be seekers. Now, look back on 2019 and ask yourself this question, did I really seek that which I wanted? Did I really seek that whom I wanted, Christ? Was I a God chaser? Were you a God chaser this year? Or were you more laid back? You know, under the banner of rest, you know, we'll justify it. But passivity doesn't get it in the kingdom of God. And I think that's what he's trying to say. You've got to go seek out what it is you want. Too often I get people come to my office and they're counseling, they say, I'm asking God to do this. What's the will of God for my life? I want him to give me this. I want him to give me some direction. I want him to give me some provision. Nothing wrong with any of that. It's all great. It's all wonderful. But at at the same time, you've got to, it's not a one way street, it's a two way. Are you pursuing him? Are you seeking his treasure? It's kind of like the guy goes, well, just pray for me. I just need provision. Um, Are you willing to work? Oh, well, I'm not going to work. That's an extreme example, but I heard of a guy the other day who was up here in the mountains, and he goes, what do you do for a living? He says, well, I do X, Y, Z in the construction business about three days a week. And he goes, why do you just work three days a week? And he goes, well, I haven't figured out how to do it too yet. Don't ask, me to, don't ask me to pray for your provision if you're not making an effort. It's a partnership, it's a friendship, it's a two-way deal, right? Faith without works is dead. So you gotta be a God chaser in this world. Now, is this me talking or the Bible? Well, hopefully it's the Bible. Hebrews 11 to six, and without faith it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Are you diligently seeking Christ? And if so, what does that look like? And would he have the same opinion you do about seeking him? Fair question. Oh, are you seeking other things more so than you're seeking Christ? That too is a question you might want to answer. Matthew 7 and 8, for anyone who asks and receives, anyone who seeks finds, anyone who knocks, the door will be open. You find things when you seek out for them. Colossians 3, 1, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. There's a high calling on your life. And in 2020, I think it would be safe to say, in this day and age, you need to be a treasure seeker. You need to seek out the kingdom of God. Seek out First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Matthew 6 and 13, 33, sorry. Psalm 27 and 8, you have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Now, if you're not, if you're not bored with this kind of message, you best just skip church on the 5th and the 12th because we're gonna get more and more involved in, as this fast comes up, how we're going to seek the face of God and the pre- bread of his presence. I'm going to give you some really practical ideas on on how you can become more of a treasure hunter, a seeker of God, and not just wait on him. There's a time for that, and there's a time not to. No sitting back. No passivity. No entitlement. Going after God. Taking heaven by storm. Violently, if need be. Treasure hunters. Well, this treasure hunter finds something hidden in a field. All right, here's how it works. How many of you, uh, is there anyone here old enough to remember anything having to do with the Great Depression? Okay. All right, I'll go ahead and tell the story anyway. (laughs) There was a woman who just came out of the Great Depression uh, as a kid, and back then they didn't trust in banks, right, Dottie? They didn't trust in banks. So after the Great Depression, you put your money in a bank, So this old woman, she was a widow, lived by herself. She would save up her money for a rainy day, but she would put it in the walls of her house. Maybe I've told you this before. The walls of her house would fill up with money. The problem was she died and her house had to be condemned. She had no family members, left no inheritance. So the city condemned her house and had it torn down. And the person tearing down the house took the city to court because they felt like they owned the money in the walls of the house. She had no legacy, nowhere to leave it. She just rat-holed it in between the sheetrock in her house, and they had a court battle over who's to get it. Well, that's not unlike Bible times. In Bible times, they didn't have a bank. 
Those of you who've been to Israel, you notice every one of those sites we go to where Jesus walked and taught. Have you ever seen like on the corner, like an Integra bank next to where the, no, they didn't have any banks. So if you had a large sum of money and you wanted to protect it, you didn't want anybody stealing it from you or breaking into your house, you buried it somewhere on your land. That was your bank. Or worse yet, let's say you had to go to war. This is even more complicated. You're gonna be gone for a year, two years, maybe three. Maybe you're not gonna come back. You would bury your excess money on your land so that when you returned, you knew it was there and wasn't taken from you while you were off defending your country. Well, that's what this guy happens upon. Now, a treasure hunter in that day, probably, if you're savvy, would have said, who went off to war and who died? Now, let me look their land over. Let me walk their land. Let me see where there's a shallow, kind of disrupted soil somewhere. Let me find some treasure. Well, this guy found some treasure. No one could claim it. It was hidden in a field. The excitement of happening upon big treasure chest. This is huge. When I read the story, I think, well, why didn't he just throw in the bag of his pickup and get on out of there? Well, he wasn't that kind of guy. He recognized the worth of the treasure, so he reburied it. And then he says, I'm gonna go off and I'm gonna make a bunch of money, I'm gonna get as much money as I possibly can, and I'm gonna come buy the field. Because if I buy the field, then the treasure belongs to me. Never mind the ethics of, <laughs> and sit around long enough for Jesus that afternoon to get the ethics of buying the field, not letting the person know that there was a, but then again, what are you gonna do? Of course, my mind goes, I watch too many stupid TV shows, my mind goes to, if he dug it up and then he buried it and then he put dirt back on it, doesn't it look like someone digged up a treasure in his absence as he's earning money to buy the field? Probably. Let's not get off on a rabbit trail. This man found something very valuable. He searched after it. And because it was valuable, he was gonna give up everything to get it. And that became his focal point. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And this, sort of, this goes back to uh, May 17, 1987, Atlanta Journal-Constitution. A rock collector named Rob Cutshaw owned a little roadside shop outside Andrews, North Carolina. Like many in the trade, he hunts for rocks, then sells them to collectors or jewelry makers. He knows enough about rocks to decide which to pick up and sell, but he's no expert. He leaves the appraising of his rocks to other people. As much as he enjoys the work, it doesn't always pay the bills. He occasionally moonlights cutting wood to help put bread on the table. While on a dig 20 years ago, Rob found a rock he described as purdy and big. He tried unsuccessfully to sell the specimen, but kept the rock under his bed or in his closet. He guessed the blue chunk would bring as much as $500, but he would have taken less if something urgent came up, like paying the power bill. That's how close Rob came to hawking a few hundred dollars and turned out would be the largest, most valuable sapphire ever found. The blue rock that, Bob, that Rob had abandoned to the darkness of a closet two decades ago, now known as the Star of David Sapphire, weighs nearly a pound and can easily sell for $2.75 million. Do you understand the value of what you have? Do you take for granted a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you understand what's available to you and the riches of walking in the counsel, the wisdom, the authority, the anointing, the power and the encouragement and the fruit of the Spirit of God? It is so easy to take those things and to kind of put them on the shelf in the closet and pull them out when you need them most. When a crisis comes or a, something tragedy befalls you, then those things that we are sort of passive and receiving and enjoying and talking about with rhetoric become that much more potent and very relevant. And, and then we pull them off the shelf and we know, okay, I need this now. This is uh, no joke. I see people do this all the time. They're in the distance of the church. They're in proximity enough. They're seen enough. And then all of a sudden, boom, a crisis hits. And they're on the front row. 
and they have to do good. If I could just do good, this crisis will not be the end of me. The crisis will pass. I'll not die. I will live. And in that season of doing good, to warrant some sort of answer from God, they clean their life up. They go to great lengths to rid themselves of their vices and their sins, to be good, to do good, to warrant the easing and the cessation of that pertinent crisis. And then the crisis is abated and it's taken care of and they're deemed healthy again and they're deemed well again and off they go to their vices where they're no longer good until they warrant and need badly something very valuable done in their life, they will return. I've seen people do this three times on a performance basis with God, on a works righteous basis with God, to perform before him for a season to warrant an abatement of a crisis. Do you understand, do I understand, Sometimes the regularity and the familiarity with the church and the, and the accessibility to the word and the, the, uh, the opportunities that abound to be in the word and Bible studies and whatnot, we miss the, the, the thing that's right there in front of us. This is a valuable treasure that people are dying without, perishing eternally without. I have this. I have this revelation. I have this knowledge. I remember when that treasure was hidden from me. I couldn't see it. The Gentiles couldn't see it. The Old Testament prophets couldn't see it. It was hidden. It was a hidden treasure. I couldn't, I could no more speak the name of Jesus without feeling awkward, let alone sing it repeatedly as we did this morning. It was hidden for me. It was masked. It was in darkness. It was cloaked in my own self-ego. And maybe it is to you today. Maybe you're here today and you can't see it. It doesn't mean it's not real. It's been hidden from you and you're apart from him. (laughs) I know that feeling, brother. I know that feeling, young lady. I know what that feels like. I know the hopelessness of it. I know the pressure that comes upon me when God is hidden from me that I must do something to warrant something more than I have. And I know in the deep down bottom of my heart I don't have the ability to do what I think I need to do to warrant God. That's a frustrating, no-win situation. Hidden. No one's down on you because you don't have Christ. No one's judging you because you're not saved. He's hidden from you. The time isn't yet come to pass where you can see him for who he really is, but when you do, oh my word, when you do. He's radiant and So attentive, compassionate, so interested, so available, so revelatory. He's so insightful. Oh, and thank God, he's so patient when he's no longer hid. Well, between where you are now and that reality, ask him, Would you reveal yourself to me, please? Would you reveal yourself to me, please? Because even saying that bothers some people because they don't feel, one, that he would, and two, that they're worthy of him doing it. But in reality, he will, and you are. He died for you. In fact, he's dying to reveal himself to you, looking for an invitation. Ask him. Reveal yourself to me. Why are all these people so excited about Christ? What do you think, we had some sort of mass hallucination or something? You think we're drinking some sort of Kool-Aid? What do you think, we're on drugs? No, I'm telling you, he's real. Transformative, life-giving. He liberates a man or a woman. He heals a human body. He, he gives you a sense of peace and joy. And he, he blesses upon blessing upon blessing of prosperity and the riches of wisdom. I, I'm telling you, he's real. He's, he may, you may be hidden from you right now. I'll ask him to reveal himself. He's a treasure. In fact, he calls you his treasured possession. That's right, he owns you. Uh, what do you mean he owns you? 
Well, he owns you because he paid for you. What do you mean he paid for you? He bought you. What do you mean he bought you? With his blood. He ransomed you. There's a serious ransom put out there. He paid it. His own life. That you might have access to the Father and enjoy all that we're talking about this morning. Hidden. Speaking of hidden, Psalm 119.11, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Peek into, just peek into 2020 for a second. Peek into it, like you've peeked into other years. You know what you see? Probably a little more self-discipline. How many times do you have to go through a year asking for self-discipline and realizing you're not really gonna get much of it? <laughs> Please do not, I will, I will literally hit you. If you come up to me and say, if you come up to me and say, this year I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna memorize over 500 scriptures. Boom! Let's just get it over with. You're gonna fall on your face anyway. I'm not asking you how many scriptures you're gonna memorize. I had this professor one time, whom I didn't like, but it wasn't so bad because I didn't go to his class very often, so it really wasn't an issue. He says, I'm not trying to get you to memorize something. He said, I wanna to come to your house 20 years from now in the middle of the night between two and three in the morning. I wanna wake you up out of the dead sleep and I wanna ask you one question and I want you to be able to answer it. I said, wow. I'm not sure I want that guy in my house, but let's say I did. And he woke me up out of the dead sleep 20 years from now and asked me one question, I'd be able to answer it. It's not on the top of my head, I can tell you that. It would have to be hidden in my heart. You see, there's, the world's full of people who have head knowledge of the scripture. Much fewer have it written on their heart. Many people are aware of the Bible and teach it without knowing the author. It's another thing to have it written on the tablet of your heart. You will seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I'll say it again. I've said it a million times. Do you have a verse? Do you have a passage that you could dwell on for an entire year that would permeate and go deep down into the chasms of your heart and take residence in there that if I woke you up 20 years from now in a dead sleep and asked you, what's the meaning of that passage? You'd spend the rest of the night telling me the testimonies of how that passage came to pass in your life. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I don't know about you, I, I have, uh, from time to time, I don't remember things. Am I the only one? <laughs> so I was talking with a counselor about it, some guy who studied this, and I was waiting for him to tell me, well, you just don't pay attention, or you're too, dis you know, whatever. Why don't you pay better attention? I said, man, no, you don't understand. It's not that I don't remember what was said. I don't remember the entire conversation and whether it even took place. Is anybody here walked in a room and go, why am I here? Why do I, why do I walk in here? Is there anyone here, uh, this has probably never happened, is, have you ever forgotten anybody's name at church? <laughs> he says, well, listen, you're a halfway decent guy. It's not that you're callous that you don't care. He goes, I got a study for you. I go, give it to me, man, give it to me. He says, there's a study that when, you, when people have so much going on in their life, their frontal lobes max out. Huh? I like it so far. Their frontal lobes max out and other parts, of, other lobes of the brain try to compensate for the information that can't fit in there. And those lobes of your, of your brain are fright or flight. They're not into long-term memory storage. They're into evaluating immediately and getting rid of it or whatever, and acting upon it. I'm not an uncompassionate, inattentive, callous egomaniac. My frontal lobe's too full. <laughs> That's gross. Awesome. I've got to empty my frontal lobe.
If you're here and your spouse is not, you can use that. <laughs> there may be some truth to that. We get so frenetic, we get so, whew, that we're not storing things in our minds and as a result, we're not getting it from our mind to our heart. What is it you're gonna do next year in this two-way, not one-way partnership with God? Where what exchange from between the two of you gets hidden down in your heart that I could wake you up and you can tell me from your heart what it was all about 20 years from now? That's worth talking about. That's worth living. That's seeding something deep. That's where you love them with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Notice heart comes first. You're an American. Therefore, if one is good, two is better. And if two is great, three is stupendous. More means more. More is better. When the rest of the world is looking at us like, duh, less is more quality over quantity, and it gets into the church. Seed something deeper down in here that changes what you do out here. Not cliches, not rhetoric. Less will yield more if you get it deeper. Start small, go deep, and think big. The world's full of people that are thinking big, remaining shallow and having to do it all over again. What's hidden, what hidden treasure? You are his hidden treasure. You are his pocket change. In Hebrew, it means pocket change. It means he has something in his pocket he doesn't have to give to dupe energy. He has something left over that is for his enjoyment that's not already accounted for. God has you in mind to enjoy, to spend time with, to laugh with, to care for, to go on walks with, to go fishing with, to go hunting with, to sit in a deer stand with, to buy gifts with. He's got things he wants to do with you and he has extra left over because you are his treasured possession. Sorry, get used to it. You're worthy. The body of David Livingstone was buried in England where he was born but his heart was buried in Africa, the Africa he loved. What? At the foot of a tall tree in a small African village, the natives dug a hole and placed in it the heart of this man who they loved and respected. If your heart were to be buried in the place you love most during life, where would it be? I'm being asked that question more and more often. My wife asked me going down the road the other day, where do you want to be buried? I'm like, why are you asking me that question? <laughs> buried. So I didn't answer it. I just turned it back on her, well, where do you want to be buried? <laughs> then I forgot she asked me the question. <laughs> where would your heart be buried? What's your body, your heart? David Livingstone had a deep-seated heart for the African people, for the, for the beauty of the place, the beauty of the people, the smiles of the people, the hearts of the people. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do you wanna know where your heart would be buried? Look at your checkbook, look at your bank statement. For some of us, Dillard's. <laughs> Just saying, think about it. You know, the tragic thing about this little parable is that some dude took his hard earned money and he put it in his backyard and he went off to war and died and there was no legacy, there was no inheritance. His ministry could have gone on beyond his life through his resources. People don't think this way. I've met many people who have amassed an abundance in life 
and now find themselves trying to figure out what to do with it beyond their death. How would I build the kingdom with that money? And if I were to give it to my family, not oftentimes, but sometimes it's like casting your pearls before swine. They, don't, they don't, would know what to do with it. In fact, it would be a detriment to them to have the abundance. Well, I'll help you, call me. Let's talk about how you build the kingdom. If not here in this church, somewhere, let's strategically place your riches in the field that's gonna bear the most fruit for the kingdom of God. That's a conversation that needs to be had sometimes and sometimes not. Jesus the Christ sought us out. He, he was a seeker, he was a treasure seeker and he came incarnate to this world looking for you for knowing your need of him that he might hide himself in our hearts. And now we fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Scorning its shame, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I follow Christ because he was a treasure seeker. I follow him because he sees value in us and had us in his heart. I follow him because he sees the potential in what others don't see. I follow him because he knows where to look. And if you have something of value to place down in my heart that's gonna change the way I see myself, God, the world, and you, I'm in. If there's some seed that needs to be planted in the human heart in the year ahead, ask yourself this, what seed would I plant? What scripture would I plant? If it's something that's gonna make you more attentive to the needs of others, if it's gonna make you more patient before other people, if it's gonna cause you to love other people more, if it's gonna intensify and multiply the amount of compassion that you have, plant it deep, hide it in your heart. It's there, it's part of you. It's not something you do, it's who you are. That's transformative. If you have a relationship with someone that's strained, what would you hide in your heart that you might not sin against God by continually trading insult for insult? What are you planting? What are you watering? What, what is it that you are going to make a nugget out of that at this point is just rhetoric or every day, just a line in a book? What will become a treasure to you? These are questions you should be asking. With a fast ahead, you should be asking these questions. What is it I'm gonna meditate on? What is it I'm gonna digest? What is gonna become part of my heart? What is it that's gonna change this 21 days and make it different than any other 21 days? Just one thing, one thing. Plant it deep, hidden deep, manifested and manifold riches of God in my heart. Might not be 21 devotions, it might be one. It might be one phrase, it might be one prepositional phrase. One verse of scripture planted deep within your heart, what is it? That's time well spent. Excuse me, that's time invested. But we've done this before. Did you? Did you? Good, do it again. The bread of his presence. An opportunity to join nearly a thousand college students who look to us for direction in a humble church outside, 60 kilometers outside of Paris to pray diligently one for another to plant something deep and hide it in our heart that we might not sin against him. What a great opportunity. You are his treasured possession. You have great value to him. He's interested in you. He wants a two-way relationship with you. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ, as your personal Lord and Savior, it's likely for this one reason. The reality of the truth, of the love, and the grace that's available to you has been hidden from you. Behind what? Distraction, self, what you've been taught, what you've been doing. But maybe today, 
he's revealed himself to you, that you are worth pursuing, and that maybe you do need to pursue him. He does have something for your heart. It changes the way you think and feel and act. It changes your desires. Maybe this God of which I speak could give you a desire for him now that he's no longer hidden. And you get to do what you want to do, pursue him. Because in the end, we're going to do what we all want to do anyway. Let's say we want to pursue him. Let's do that. Is there anyone here that's never, it's okay if you haven't, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? He's otherwise been hidden. And now maybe you have a crack, a crack in your heart wasn't there 30 minutes ago, an hour ago, or maybe he might be able to get in there. Maybe even set up shop, start speaking to you, start teaching you. Maybe that's happened. If that's the case, I wanna pray for you. If you're listening to this message, in 2020, 2021, 22, 23, 24, I don't know, pull your car off the side of the road and listen to what I'm saying. Open your heart up to Jesus Christ and invite him in where he can take residence in your heart. Anybody need to receive that Christ of which I speak? Just raise your hand so I can see it. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. No? Okay. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, these here are apparently yours. Hide your word in their heart that they might not sin against you. And I put myself, Lord, at the top of that list. To those who will listen, who are seeking, looking for something, truth, someone, reveal yourself to them. Let them open their heart to you and invite you to come take tabernacle with them, to come into their heart and live as Lord and Savior. Forgive them of their sin and give them eternal life. Give us that willingness and openness in Jesus' name the church said, Amen.